the bird flu pandemic in the United States is driving up egg prices. But on this side of the Atlantic Ocean, I worry much more that Americans are breeding the next human pandemic. A month ago, we saw a lot of scary headlines saying that we're just one mutation away from that. It turns out, though, that this wasn't quite right. Today, I have a brief update on the bird flu pandemic in the United States and some thoughts on what we learned or didn't learn from COVID. The current bird flu or avian flu virus is a variant of the type H5N1. It jumped over to cattle and other mammals in the United States one year ago. It also infected at least 60 people in the US, one of whom died in December, a 65-year-old with pre-existing conditions who contracted the illness directly from birds. There's also been one reported human case in Canada. The cattle seem to not be all that bothered, but they've been spreading the virus across the country and to various wild domestic and zoo animals. In December, a cheetah and a mountain lion were reported dead from the virus in a zoo in Phoenix. Foxes, bears, minks, cats, dogs, tigers and leopards also have all been found infected. Basically, the virus now covers the entire U.S. mainland. According to the U.S. Center for Disease Control, there has so far been no evidence for human-to-human -human transmission. But keep in mind that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. How dangerous is this virus? The reported cases in the U.S. in humans have so far almost all been mild, except for the one person who died. But this virus has been around for about 20 years and it's previously led to minor outbreaks of some hundreds of people, the biggest ones in Egypt and Indonesia. In these earlier outbreaks, the case fatality rate has been roughly 50% and it was higher among young people. The case fatality rate is the fraction of people who died among the infections on record and might miss those who were infected but had little to no symptoms. But still, it's clearly a nasty virus and that it's inching closer to humans isn't comforting at all. Now, last month, there was some commotion in the news about a study which allegedly found that the current strain of the virus is only one mutation away from becoming a new pandemic. This was somewhat of a misstatement of the paper, though. What the study actually found is that the virus is one mutation away from being able to attach to certain receptors in the human lung. But this is isn't the only mutation that would be necessary to make the virus infectious among humans. It would also have to be able to enter cells and to reproduce plentifully in them, which would require further mutations. But the virus will keep on mutating and it's just a matter of time until human-to-human -human transmission begins. If not with this virus, then with another one. And then what? Human vaccines against the virus exist, but they need to be adapted to the current strain. Already in July last year, the Biden administration handed out $176 million to Moderna. And just before the Trump inauguration, they followed up with another $590 million. That's a lot of money for something you hope not to use. And it's not just in the US. Pharma companies globally are preparing to roll out vaccines quickly and countries have have begun to put in orders. In June, the EU signed up for small orders called pre-pandemic that are meant for those most at risk of being infected. In December, the UK ordered 5 million for a similar purpose. Norway has ordered two doses for everyone. Still producing those and rolling them out will take as much as six months after the onset of the pandemic, which means we'll have to think about lockdowns again. So what, if anything, have we learned from COVID? Well, one thing I learned is that despite all the decades of talking about pandemic preparedness, no one had any sensible lockdown plans. It took seemingly forever to come up with local indicators and to find out what actually worked and what not. Instrumental for this were in the end cheap and fast tests. I'm afraid that the world is missing the boat again. We'll need rapid tests in the supermarkets long before we need vaccines. The other thing that I hope 
hope we learned from COVID is that what sounds plausible doesn't always make sense. And if a situation evolves fast, one needs to react fast. After the first lockdown, it was apparent that scientists had underestimated the enormous psychological toll, but then were unable or unwilling to roll back on measures that evidently were not working, like travel bans. The brief summary is, it's not a pandemic yet but it's working on its resume. Science isn't just interesting, it's also inspiring. That's why I'm always looking for new science stories and my favorite magazine for this is Nautilus. If you're also looking for information and inspiration, you should really have a look. Nautilus has a digital and a print version and it's just a pleasure to read. They really put a lot of effort into writing and the graphic design is amazing. You notice immediately if you open the print version that it's a high quality production. I've written several contributions for Nautilus myself about physics, black holes, quantum gravity, quantum mechanics and, you know, the stuff I normally write about. But I enjoy this magazine because it tells me what's going on in other areas. What I particularly like about Nautilus is that they cover all areas of science, from astronomy to economics, history, neuroscience to philosophy and physics. They'll pick the most relevant topics and give you all the context. To get access to all the full stories on Nautilus, you need a paid subscription. But Nautilus now also has a free newsletter, which you can subscribe to at readnautilus.com. And it's not just the newsletter, because as a free subscriber, you'll get access to an unlocked story with every email, including the ones that I wrote. That's 16 free stories a month. So give it a try and join more than 600,000 intellectually curious readers at readnautilus.com. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.